Hi, welcome back to Money Hungry by Sharon Flake. I'm going to read chapters 24 through 28. Chapter 24. Mom is shaking me, trying to, me, trying to get me up so we can leave this place before people start heading for work. I turn back over. I know Mama's got to go to work. I feel like I've been working all night long myself. I open my eyes to ask Mama to please let me sleep a little longer. She's got dark circles under her eyes. Her smile is gone. She is tired. Too tired to argue with me this morning. But she still doesn't give in. She says she's got to get our car out of the driveway or people will suspect something. And even though it's still dark out, she tells me to hurry up and get dressed. It's bad enough that we're here without permission. If somebody finds you here alone, we'll be in more trouble than you know. Before too long, we are sneaking out the back door and driving away. Mama and me eat breakfast in a tiny restaurant with real nice dishes and the best donuts I've ever had. After that, she drops me off in front of school. It's early. Nobody is around except a few teachers going into the building. Mama says that she needs to take care of some businesses, some business before work. She drives away without even saying goodbye. For a minute, I try to talk myself out of skipping school. But the next thing I know, I'm walking across the street waiting for the bus. I figure I need the money more than I need to hear teachers run off at the mouth today. So I go to odd jobs where I know I can make some fast bucks without being hassled. Odd job, don't take no breaks. Him and his boys are right there on the corner making dough from the lunchtime crowd. He throws me a rag as soon as I walk up. Don't even ask me why I ain't in school. I'm good at, good at washing cars and making change. Odd job saying maybe he's just going to let me handle the money. You do figuring faster than anybody I know, he says, taking a rag and wiping some dirt out my hair. When it slows down, he finally asks me, why ain't you in school? His boys is working on the other cars. He's sitting in a lounge chair, got the seat back and the footrest up. I'm sitting on a metal milk crate. I tell him, I just didn't want to go to school today. Odd job sits up, pushes, pushes the footrest back and stares at me good. Don't lie, he says, his voice getting serious. It's like being with the principal or something. Only odd job ain't got on no suit, and he probably ain't sat at a desk since he dropped out of high school. You can't lie if you're going to be working with me, he says, standing up, yelling at some man across the way. He laughs. You want your car washed? I'm open more days than 7-Eleven, he says to the man. Then he turns to me and tells me that he knows what went down at her house. Starts saying how Check and Shoe hooked up with some baby thugs, and they all went in our place and got busy. My fist curls up. Where are they at? I say. You gonna do something to them? Odd job says, taking a bunch of clean rags off the fence. You're a fighter now? I feel my fist relax. He got our stuff. Your stuff is gone. It's all over the place. They know where it's at, I say, walking up to the car to a car and asking if they want to buy something to drink. Washing their front window before they even ask. When I get back to odd job, he acts like we ain't having no conversation. He got his lounge chair laying back and his eyes closed. Before too long, he's snoring. People are walking by him to catch the bus and go to work. They're driving up to get a car wash or something to drink, and he's asleep. His boys, they don't miss a beat, though. They're wetting down rides, pushing those fans, telling me to hustle if I want to hold on to the change bag. Next thing I know, odd job is up. He's closing up the lounge chair, standing up and stretching, starting the conversation right where we left off ten minutes ago. It's water under the bridge, he says, talking about our stolen stuff. You would take care of check and shoe if they stole your stuff. I know it, I say, taking out the pink lemonade, Icy, and linking it. I don't lend money, and I don't make no enemies, he says, and when people screw me, I let natural consequences take care of them. I look at Odd Job real funny-like. He walks away and starts working on somebody's ride. When he comes back, he says, you don't have to shoot people or hurt them. When they mess with your head and stuff, just give them time. They're going to do something to make their own lives miserable. I still don't get what he's saying. He can see that on his, see, he can see that on my face. Natural consequences, Raspberry Cherry. Just leave people be for long enough, and they will screw things up for themselves, sure enough. I ain't sure if our job got no family or nothing, but every once in a while, somebody like me, a kid, be working for him, and every now and then I hear about somebody taking off with some of his cash. The word on the street is, things happen when you cross him. Natural consequences? 
I ain't so sure. Where are you and your mama staying, he asks. I give him a look that says I don't have a clue. I got a place, he says. It ain't much. Last time I looked, the dogs did it up real bad. But it'll keep you warm. Got running water and a little furniture? I look at Oddjob. He got on these funny boots. They wrapped with tape right across the middle. And the shoestrings are missing. His pants are drooping. He got to pull them up every once in a while. But the word around here is that he got a lot of money. Lots of it. Property, too. Apartments all around his way. All around this way. I got to talk to Mama, I say. Maybe she's planning on us coming back to home tonight. Odd shapes, it shakes his head. I wouldn't. You on the list now. Folks going to be busting in all the time. I've been out here a while. I smell like it, too. So when another car pulls up, I stay put. Let Odd Jobs boys go for it. I ain't sure where you're going to be laying your head, you know, he says, handing me another icy. But you better not be missing no more school, you hear, he says. I see in his eyes that he means what he says. I'm going to school tomorrow, I say. I know, I know, Miss Raspberry Sweets, he says, squirting me with one of them water fans. Then he tells me to get busy and stop costing him money by eating up his profits. Before I know anything, he's handing me a bottle of water and telling me to take a break and go use the bathroom at the gas station three blocks away. Gorsh, girls shouldn't be smelling like men, you know what I mean, he says. I take the hint and go get myself cleaned up. When I get back, I grab me a rag and start washing down the first car I see. Raspberry, what in the world? It's Zora's dad, Dr. Mitchell, and I can tell by his voice he ain't happy about finding me out here like this. Chapter 25. Hey, Dr. Mitchell, I say, rubbing a spot off the hood. You getting the whole thing done or just the windows? I don't look him in the eyes. Are you cutting school, he says, stepping out of his car. I find another tiny spot and start rubbing that one, too. Get in, he says, going around to the other side, opening the door for me. What's going on? Look at yourself, he says, making a face. I look at Odd Job, then I look at Dr. Mitchell. I ain't finished. Let's go. Now, he says. He's acting like my father or something, bossing me around. But I do what he says, because all he got to do is tell Mama, and then I'm going to be in more trouble. I got to go, Odd Job, I say, handing over the money pack. He reaches in the purple sack and pulls out some bills. He hands me $15 and says he'll see me later. After school one day, all right? When I'm in Dr. Mitchell's car, I hear Odd Job's big voice say for us to hold up. Raspberry Cherry, he says, leaning inside the car. You cool for tonight? He says. He asks, trying to see if we got a warm place to lay my head. Yeah, because you know I got a place for y'all, he says to me real quiet. Except for that dog crap. It's all right, you know? He says, I know, I say. Next thing I know, Dr. Mitchell's driving off, turning on some corny music from the station that only plays stuff with violins and flutes. <sighs> okay, let's talk, he says. I can't reach your mother. You're out here when you should be in school, and now odd job saying he has a place for you to live? We make it to the next corner before he takes his hand and slaps it on the dashboard. What's going on with you two? Is your mother all right? Before he can ask me anything else, the tears come. We, we're we going to be living back on the streets again, I say in a shaky voice. I got my money in my hand and I'm shaking all over, crying so much that Dr. Mitchell pulls the car over to the side of a busy street and holds me till I stop. Why didn't she call me, he says, wiping my face with a tissue. You could have stayed with us. I look at him and start crying again. You don't know, Dr. Mitchell, I say. When you ain't got your own place, people don't treat you right. They say, come stay with us, but when you do, they act like they can't wait for you to leave. You think it's better to be on the streets, he says, to sleep on floors or out in the cold? I don't know how many tears a person got inside him, but it must be a whole lot, because for the next hour, I cry. My face is red, my eyes are puffed, and my nose is raw from rubbing it. Dr. Mitchell ain't got no more tissues left when I'm done. Darn it, he says, slamming his fist on the steering wheel and cutting on the engine. I forgot to pick up Zora. She probably took the bus by now, he says, reminding me that school let out early today. We race through red lights and almost have an accident trying to get to Zora. On the way, Dr. Mitchell says he wants us to stay with them. I'll pick your other up from work tonight and bring her home. She needs to learn she can depend on people, he says, pulling up to the school. Seneca is sitting out front. She says that Zora left a while ago. By the time we get to their house, Zora is unlocking the front door. She rolls her eyes at me when I step out the car. 
Her father kisses her and apologizes for not picking her up, but he don't tell her why he's late or why he got me with her, him. He just says that me and Mama will be staying with them for a while. Zora don't like when people spring surprises on her. She don't look at me or say a word. When we get upstairs, Zora says, I need privacy, then shuts her bedroom door in my face. Chapter 26. At Dr. Mitchell's, Mama sleeps in the couch. I sleep on the floor in a sleeping bag in Zora's room, but she ignores me all night. During the car ride to school the next day, she keeps her mouth shut and her lips pocked out. Her dad tells her to apologize to me for being so rude. She never does, though. When the car stops, she hops out and runs into the building. I see now why Mama doesn't want to live with anybody else. It's bad enough not having a house, let alone being treated like you ain't wanted by people who are supposed to be your friends. I don't have time to feel sorry for myself, though. As soon as I get out of Dr. Mitchell's car, Sato is up in my face. Janae's in there with the cops, he says, grabbing me by the arm and almost dragging me up the steps to the building. What? I say, pulling my arm away from him. He points to a squad car parked in front of the building. Yeah, they police. They got her in the principal's office right now, Sato says, tugging at his skull cap. I forget that me and Janae ain't speaking. I hurry inside and go straight to the principal's office. There's a big cop standing out front, another one inside by the school's counselor's office where Janae is sitting. They can't make you live with people you don't want to, can they? She's saying. The police officer tells me to stay back unless I got other business here. A lady cop tells Janae that her grandparents have custody of her, and then her mom cannot just walk in here demanding her school records so she can take her to California to live. Janae smells like orange blossoms today. When I get close, I see that she's crying and holding some woman's hand. She's kind of pretty. Got long braids with cowrie shells in them. Silver bracelets from her wrist to her elbow. She's skinny, too. She's telling Janae that everything will turn out okay. But I want to live with her, Janae tells the cop. She's got money. She can take care of me, she says, pulling money out of her pocket. That's when I realize the woman is Janae's mom, the heifer. This ain't about money, girl, the cop says, looking down at her. Your grandparents got custody. If this woman wants you to come live with her, she needs to take it to court, he says, pointing to Janae's mom. Janae's granddad walks in. He's cursing at the cops and threatened to have Janae's mom locked up if she don't get herself back on the first bus out of town. While the cosh cops push him into one of guidance counselor's offices, I sneak over to Janae. You okay? I ask. She nods yes. Then she introduces me to her mother. We can hear Janae's granddad from the back office. He's telling all of Janae's business, saying how when she was three, her mom took off and left her alone in the house for two days. Then she says how her mother would spend all the money on foolishness and not have no food in the house. That's why I chased her off six years ago. He's telling the police why I didn't want her back in that child's life. I'm wondering if Janae knew any of this before. She ain't letting on that she does. And her mom doesn't seem, don't seem bothered by her granddad's words. She's just sitting there, not letting go of Janae's hand staring out the white wall in front of her. The principal tells me to get out. At first I start to walk away. Then I hear Janae crying again, saying that nobody got the right to separate her from her mom no more. I don't care that the cop has got his hand on my arm or that another cop ain't taken, talking so nice to me no more. I grab hold of Janae's and squeeze her tight. We still girls, I say. You're looking at a suspension, Miss Hill. If you don't make your way out of here right now, the principal says. Janae begs the principal to let me stay. Her granddad is yelling again. So the principal tells me to shut up and sit down so that he can quiet Janae's granddad. Kids are piling in the office wanting to hear what's going on. The bell is ringing and a teacher is getting ready to make morning announcements. The office is small. It's like a zoo in there. What the devil is going on here? One cop says. Can't you control your own school? He yells at the principal when Ming walks in to ask to see, asking to see Janae. If this doesn't concern you, get out, the principal snaps. He takes Ming by the arm and leans him out of the office. Ming, Janae yells. That's it. Everybody out, the prim principal says, coming over to us. He takes me by the arm, drags me over to the door and says, to class, Miss Hill, then shuts the door in my face. Chapter 27. When school's out, I don't even know where I'm supposed to go. Mama ain't called me all day. When I tried to reach her at work, they said she wasn't there. 
I'm sitting on the school steps trying to figure out if I should go to the house in Pecan Landings or back to our old spot. It's nice out, so I don't rush. I just sit. I don't even say nothing when Seneca walks by making smart remarks about not having a bed to sleep in. When Sato comes up, I'm ready to cry my, cry my eyes out for the second time this week. Sato sits down next to me. One of his pant legs is pushed up to the knees, to his knee. He's wearing a t-shirt, carrying his jacket across his arm. Sato sits by me for a long time, not talking, just watching people walking by. He ain't got on no socks, and his sneakers is untied. He plays with the string when he ain't checking folks out. I want to ask what he's waiting for, but it's nice to have him here and not and us not picking on each other. So we just sit. You scared? He asks me. At first I try to think of something smart to say to him, but he seems like he means what he's asking me. So I come clean. Yeah. He pulls off a sneaker and wiggles his long toes. You got a place to stay, right? I shake my head up and down, knowing full well that I ain't so sure. He puts on a sneaker and makes ready to leave. You know that stuff about I said about you being a troll living under the bridge? Yeah, I was just being smart. I know. Sometimes, though, you just get on the last nerve with all your money talk. Then he stares at me so hard I turn away. Well, I guess it's better to have a cute girl get on your nerves than an ugly one, he says, pulling on my bushy ponytail. I swallowed hard and stared at him, too. You are so good looking, I want to say, but all I do is smile and wonder if one day him and me will get together or something. Sato walks down the steps backwards, looking at me, playing with his earring at the same time. Janae's going to go live, going to live with her mom, he asks, changing the subject. I scratch my head. I don't know, I say. I saw Janae just before her granddad made her go home. She finally came clean about why she took her granddad's money and couldn't pay me what she owed me. She used the money to pay for her mother's bus heat fare here. They've been planning this a long time, I guess. Sato shakes his head. Her mother ain't gonna stick around no how. I put my hand in front of my face to block the sun. How do you know? I know. That kind of mother don't never stay put no long. You waiting on your mom? Sato asks. Yeah, I lie. Truth is, I don't know what I'm waiting for. I'm just waiting. Sato smiles and pulls some rolled up paper out of his po back pocket. Then he waves and starts walking away. You late, Miss Hill, I hear him say. I think he's kidding around at first and don't even look up till Mama opens her door and starts in on him. Boy, what are you doing out here dressed like some hoodlum, she says, fanning for me to come on. Fanning for me to come on. I'm styling, Miss Hill, he says, turning around in a circle so you can see every part of him. You could be styling, too, if you turned your ride in for a real car. Sato walks over to the car like it's his mother who came to pick him up. Mama's eyeing me. When I'm inside the car, she reaches over and gives me a hug, hands me a six-pack of gum. I offer Sato a stick before Mama drives away. Of course, he says he wants two pieces, not one. For the first time that I can remember, I'm glad to see Mama's beat-up car. And I don't even say nothing smart when the mirror falls off at the first red light we get to. She tells me she's been on the phone talking to the city, still trying to get us the new place in Pekin Landings. But where are we going to live now? I ask. Mama reaches her hand out for a stick of gum. She's quiet, like she's thinking. I'm back to crying again. Mama starts looking around the car for tissues. I dig in my pocket and pockets and book bag. Pull out some tissues and a few dollars come flying out too. I see a five and ten dollar bill, the money I got from Odd Job. Then I remembered his offer. Odd Job's got a place we can use, I tell Mama. She sits there a minute. I ain't getting excited, she says, starting the engine. But it's a place to lay our heads, she says, pulling off. I got my fingers crossed. The way things are going, I ain't, show, ain't sh so sure things with Odd Job's going to work out. But I hope they do. I sure hope they do. Chapter 28. Mama drives to see Odd Job's place. She says she wants to check it out before she decides if we're going to stay. We ain't got no place to live, and she's waiting to, wanting to see if the apartment. We ain't got no place to live, and she's waiting to see if the apartment in the building Odd Job owns is good enough for us. Seems to me, if she thought the streets was good enough once, she can't complain about a place with a little dog poop in it. 
It ain't that the place can't be fixed up, Mama says when we're finished looking around our job spot. It's just that it's going to take a while. Our job owns his house, but it's run down and smells bad. I go to the bathroom, open the window up wide, and stick my head out so I can clear the stink out my nose. Maybe we'll stay here for tonight, then move on, Mama says. Oh, can't we stay in a hotel? Mama sits in a chair and hangs her head down. We don't really know what life is going to throw our way, Raspberry, she says. But we shouldn't be wasting our time or money on no hotel. I look Mama's way. I think about all that money she threw away. Think about us living on the streets and maybe heading right back there again. I want to tell Mama that I'm tired of living like this. But then I see her pulling the nasty carpet, pulling at the nasty carpet in the living room, seeing how she thinks the floor underneath might be in good shape, talking about painting the kitchen and going to the dollar store to buy some new curtains. I dig in my pocket and hold tight to the little money, little money I got left. Tears come to my eyes when I think how hard I worked to get my money and how fast it was gone. At least I got Mama, I say, looking out the window. No matter what, I still got her. Mama and me work our fingers to the bone trying to make that apartment look like something. But it still ain't ready for us to move into yet. For once, though, Mama puts her pride aside and calls Dr. Mitchell. She asks if I can stay the night at his place. She's going to stay behind and clean up here some more. Dr. Mitchell knows better than to argue with Mama. So when he comes by, he stays a while and helps out too, even brings us some chicken and fries to snack on. On the ride to his place, Dr. Mitchell and me don't say much. Me, I'm thinking about Zora and how she treated me after I stayed at their place the last time. I got my fingers crossed, hoping she won't act like that no more. As soon as I see Dora, I, Zora, I know we're tight again. She hands me a pair of pajamas, says that we can do each other's nails after I shower if I want. She and me stayed up late talking about what happened to Janae at school today. Then Zora apologized apologizes for treating me so mean. We girls, she says, we gotta stick together no matter what. I like to sleep in on Saturday mornings. Zora does too. But after Dr. M Dr. Mitchell wakes us up to say that he's headed out to take care of some business, me and Zora get up and make some breakfast. Then we head for Janae's place. We knock at Janae's door for a long time. Don't nobody answer. I know somebody's home though. I can hear Janae's grandfather's big mouth through the basement window. I sit down on the front steps thinking of what to do. Then Zora and me go to the side of the house where Janae's room is and throw some small stones at the window until Janae appears. My mama took off again. She says there's too much drama here. When I look closer, I can see that Janae's been crying. My granddad is holding me prisoner until he's sure mama's out of town for good. Janae is talking low. How's Ming? Tell him I miss him. I will, I say. It's quiet for a minute. Janae throws something out the window. Give this to Ming. She says, it's a crumpled up piece of paper with bunches of cotton balls inside. They smell like cherries. Tell Ming to carry one in his pocket every day till he sees me again. Janae's leaning out the window. I gotta go, she says before her granddad yells her name, pulls her away from the window and slams it shut. When we get back to Zora's house, Mama's car is out front. So is Dr. Mitchell's. Mama gets out of the car and gives me a hug. You been painting? I ask, looking at the yellow paint on her shoes. After you left, she says, waving by to Zora when she goes inside the house. Ajeb came by to check on things, and he had a can of paint and helped me put the first coat on. Mama looks tired. There are circles around her eyes. I've been up half the night worrying, trying to figure out if I'm doing right by you, she says, telling me to get in the car. She's pulling out of the parking space before she even says where we're headed. Next thing I know, she's pulling up at the place in Pecan Landings. She turns and faces me. We got a good chance of moving in here, you know. I look at her like she's crazy. This morning, Dr. Mitchell took me to see a lawyer friend of his. The lawyer, Mrs. Bloom, says she knows folks in Pecan Landings want to prevent the city and the landlord from letting us move here since we would be on Section 8. She says she'll go to the court to fight for us to be able to move in this here house if that's what I want. I ask Mama how we can afford to hire a lawyer. She smiles. Then she tells me that since Miss Bloom knows we don't have a lot of money, she will let Mama pay her a little at a time. I am so happy I could just scream. 
Mama feels the same way, I guess. She's squeezing me so hard, I feel like she's going to snap me in two. It won't happen right away, she says, but by summer's end, I bet we'll be able to call this place home. We both get out of the car and stand in front of the house. Mama leans her face in her hands and rubs her, eye, her eyes with her palms. Leans her face in her hands and rubs her eyes with her palms. I rub circles on her shoulder bones. I press my thumbs right into her tight neck muscles. Listen to her say how good that feels. She closes her eyes for a minute. Then her back arches up and her arms stretch up towards the sky. We're going to have to paint here, paint this here place too, she says, walking up the front porch. Dr. Mitchell says he'll lend a hand. I bet Janae and Em will too, I say, following behind her. I think peach would be a pretty color for the living room and dining room, Mama says, closing her eyes and taking in the warm afternoon breeze. What color room do you want, she says, she asks. Blue, I tell her, with stars on the ceiling. The end.